Dzień dobry Państwu. Po raz pierwszy w mojej historii pracy na Uniwersytecie Warszawskim nie musiałem nic mówić, a publiczność zamilkła. Dzisiejsze powitanie poprowadzimy w takiej wersji troszkę po polsku i troszkę po angielsku. Myślę, że pani profesor Spiwak uszanuje tę tradycję i ten zwyczaj, żeby nie wszystko odbywało się w języku angielskim od początku do końca. To jest również wpisane w pewną myśl, którą pani profesor reprezentuje. Welcome on behalf on the, of the entire Dean's team of the Faculty of Modern Languages, the Second International Congress on Humanities, Society, Identity, Evolution, Oil Revolution. That's the topic. Welcome. I would like to um, welcome all of you, especially Mr. Vice Rector for Research for the University of Warsaw, Professor Zygmunt Lalak. Welcome. <laughs> Our guest from universities in Poland, uh, Professor Tomasz Bilczewski, Dean of the Faculty of Polish Studies, Jagiellonian University in Krakow. <laughs> Professor Marcin Jacobi, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, SWPS University in Warsaw. <laughs> Professor Darius Skurczewski, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, the Catholic University of Lublin. <laughs> Professor Monika Sidor, Vice Dean for Education, Faculty of Humanities, the Catholic University of Lublin. <laughs> Deans and representatives from the University of Warsaw. I was very much hoping for Professor Janusz Adamowski, but he probably will come in a few minutes. Uh, Professor Piotr Dijek, Dijek representing the Faculty of Ar Archaeology. <laughs> Professor Aneta Gawkowska, Dean of the Faculty of Applied so Social Sciences and Social Rehabilitation. <laughs> Professor Maciej Jędrusik, Dean of the Faculty of Geography. <laughs> and Professor Dariusz Wasik, Dean of the Faculty of Physics. Okay. I would like to welcome Tomasz Basiuk, representing the American Studies Center. Welcome. <laughs> and there uh, should be Professor Kamil Zajączkowski, the director of the Center of Euro for Europe, should be. <laughs> On Dr. Danuta Romaniuk, representing the Center for Foreign Language Teacher Training and European Education, was. <laughs> I would like to welcome all the authorities from the Faculty of Modern Languages. Uh, I can see. Dr. Cilla Gizinska, head of the Department of Hungarian Studies. Welcome. <laughs> I can al also see Professor Małgorzata Molska representing the Institute for French Studies. Welcome. <laughs> and Trau Małgorzata Sokołowicz representing the same institute. And I would like to <laughs> welcome uh, Professor Maria ba uh, Biskup representing the Institute for German Studies, welcome. <laughs> I would like to welcome our distinguished guests, especially uh, Professor Gayatri Spivak, keynote speaker, Columbia University. Welcome, Professor. Professor. <laughs> Professor Imna Josef Balaj from the Babes Bolia University. Professor Einur Elmgren from the University of Oulu. <laughs> Professor Heather Nico from the Trent University. Welcome. <laughs> and of course, Professor Francois Rosse from the University of Lausanne. Welcome. 
Welcome to you, all the participants of the Second International Humanities Society Identity Congress. And now I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Vice Rector to give us a few words. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. D Mr. Dean. Uh, well, good good morning, uh, everyone, on this uh, cloudy but still wonderful morning. Uh, 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 it's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you at the University of Warsaw in this uh, wonderful new building uh, uh, recently constructed for the purpose of hosting such meetings and for the purpose of hosting our science and uh, social sorry, social uh, sciences and uh, humanities i mean this is this is why why we uh, so often come here and why this is why uh, such occasions as uh, this ones are pretty frequent in this in this uh, new building well <laughs> As you know, as you know, University of Warsaw is the largest and the best university in this country. Well, <laughs> and uh, uh, well, we uh, we are uh, strongly committed to building the reputation of the university uh, at the European and, in general, international scale as a unit, as a center of uh, scientific research in all disciplines, in sciences, in social sciences, and, and in humanities. And part, part of that effort is hosting international events. And it is great pleasure to count among those, among those events the Second Congress on Humanities, Society, and Identity. Uh, the title is uh, inspiring, actually. It encompasses uh, many, many topics which, uh, which are subject of a hot debate at various levels in the contemporary societies, also taking into account complicated external conditions which in which we are living and in which we are working over the, uh, over the recent, uh, recent months. There, there is a very broad meaning to all the words uh, which are uh, written in the title. And it is also pretty interesting for scientists like me to notice that uh, uh, the order comes from uh, the most abstract uh, notion of humanities in general through the society down to the local, local kind of a local notion uh, uh, because the identity could be could be understood also in personal terms it could be it could reflect uh, our uh, personal experience our personal lives this is an interesting very interesting point of view and i would be more than happy to stay with you for the whole conference unfortunately <laughs> this is this is not this is not possible we have, uh, as the university, we are participating in uh, a number of international uh, enterprises. Uh, we have signed by now about uh, 1,000 of uh, mutual agreements between the University of Warsaw and various external institutions concerning uh, uh, collaboration on scientific and educational, educational matters. Uh, at present, we are running about uh, 100 uh, international 100 of international projects international programs in which uh, researchers scientists educators but also students and phd students are actively engaged university of warsaw is a member of the international alliance of universities the so-called for you plus alliance uh, together with seven uh, seven European universities, including Sorbonne, uh, Charles University from Prague, Copenhagen University, uh, Heidelberg University. I mean, this is this is des designed. This association, this alliance, is designed to to become an Euro European university within, say, five or ten years. The university which will have common educational programs, common research programs, and which 
which uh, will eventually issue uh, common common diplomas. I mean that is that is a very important alliance from the point of view of the plans of the University of Warsaw, p the, say future developments in all the areas which are relevant for the university, so education and uh, research. And among all the initiatives which contribute uh, to the expansion of the University of Warsaw, of our activities in those directions, in those areas, conferences like this one play a very, very important role. First of all, those conferences bring to Warsaw distinguished scholars, experts, who can uh, share their knowledge and their experience, also life experience, uh, with us, with the local community of uh, researchers and educators, but also because it brings together a number of, uh, a huge number of young people, students and PhD students. I believe those students represent various disciplines, various areas of study, and this is, uh, this is very promising and this is important because this, is, this gives us all a chance to start an engaging debate which could result in novel ideas, in new projects, in further, in further development of our activities. So I am very happy that uh, we, we are here, that uh, you will have a chance over the next two days to participate in the engaging conference program uh, put together by, by, the, by the organizational committee. I mean, sincere congratulations to the members of the organizational committee for, for uh, taking care of uh, inviting distinguished speakers, of putting various uh, topics over this next two days, I mean the topics which will, which will eventually engage everyone present in the, in the program of the conference in this international debate. I understand that uh, you are all ready for the first keynote speech by our distinguished guests. I, I am not going to talk um, much longer. However, uh, once again, I would like to congratulate to the organizers. I would like to congratulate all the participants for choosing this uh, conference for, for your presence here at the University of Warsaw and I wish you all two inspiring days full of networking and scientific debates. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for those words. Well, now I should um, present to you Professor Gayatri Spivak, but I don't think it's very much needed because I think uh, most of us are here because we all know what Professor Spivak does and did. Uh, a few words only. Now, as I'm concerned, she's completing a book on W.E.B. Dubois or as a philosopher of the future. She was awarded the 2012 Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy for being a critical theorist and educator speaking for the humanities against intellectual colonialism in relation to the globalized world. 2013, she received the Padma Bhushan, the third highest civilian award given by the Republic of India. She is a member of the American F Philosophical Society, a corresponding fellow and cross member of the Anthropology and Geography section of the British Academy and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So, Professor Spivak, as you can see, we are back in the 60s where the students wanted a change. Uh, as you can see, we are all here around because we all want to listen to a great mind that give us, gives us a, all a chance for, for the chance. We would like to listen to you and please, the floor is yours.
Thank you very much indeed for having, can you hear me now? You can hear me now. Can you? In the back? Thank you very, very much for having, can I have a watch? I forgot to put on my own. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Ten twenty-nine. Okay, ten twenty-nine. But um, so I am um, really am delighted that you've done up like this. But I hope you're not disappointed because you know it's a. Uh, I don't always deliver words of great wisdom. Let me just simply say that I'm myself very honoured to be to have been invited. I uh, speak in the name of peace. I'm not going to go into um, any kind of political discourse, so I will just simply say, call me Palestinian. <laughs> Sorry about this. You know what this is? It's the polluted air of my hometown. I love Calcutta, but the air's heavy. That's what gives me this. My thanks go first to Professor Maria Balkan, who invited me last year to the first International Humanities Society Identity Congress. I was greatly honored, and I still think it would have been a great honor to have participated in that first one, but the notice was too short. This year, I must thank Marta Rzehak of the Faculty of Modern Languages for bearing with my insane schedule and an office teetering on the brink of collapse, a collapse now it has fully suffered, but Marta just stayed with me all along the way, always patient, always understanding. Thank you, Marta. I also thank Natalia Bryanievska, who has been taking care of me since I came here in every detail of uh, my comfort here. Thank you. The Collège International de Philosophie was founded 40 years ago through the French Ministry of Culture rather than the Ministry of Education. That anniversary is being celebrated in Paris from tomorrow onwards. I was a minor player in that one. Uh, I would like to tell you a funny story about how long ago, how long ago our efforts, your efforts, to make a change in the way we do things happened. It was the Ministry of Culture rather than the Ministry of Education because, as most of you probably know here, the French Ministry of Education is pretty well, uh, pretty well organized. I've myself taken part in some of these juries of the Agreg. There's something else. So uh, Derrida and Lyotard wanted to have, a, have a, um, a college where one would actually speak freely. Um, the professor of philosophy at Yale wrote a letter to the Minister of Culture saying uh, Derrida should not be encouraged because he was not really a philosopher, because he had not followed, and she used the horrible English word there, guidelines. He had not followed the guidelines laid down by Descartes. Okay. How do I know this? The Minister of Culture showed this letter to Jacques Derrida, who showed it to me. But the Minister of Culture had written a message by hand, which was, do not walk downstairs in front of this person. So I'm telling you this story because this really tells us the kind of alliance that you and I inhabit, an alliance that started not 40 years ago, long ago, but my experience with it really came home to me with that handwritten note which said, 
don't walk downstairs in front of this person. As Kant said, there is violence in the faculty. So in the name of a violence we sometimes are complicit with, I will go on to say that the, I'm sorry that I have to leave tomorrow to get back to New York because there are many special sessions that speak directly to my interests and I hate missing them. Today I will go to however many I can go to. I particularly mind missing the capstone presentation of Ben Crystal precisely because I don't know what to expect. And, sur and surpri surprise, as Aristotle knew, was one, is one of the best gifts of the literary humanities experience. I should actually start my... See, I'm usually not a person who reads from computers, but I don't, I don't think, and this thing is asking me to shut it down. But at any way, where, when the Collegiate Nacional de Philosophie was founded, Derrida spoke in the following way, and I quote the English translation. He said that we want to provide a place to work on the value and meaning of the basic, the fundamental, on its opposition to finalization, finalization, which is badly translated, it translated here as goal orientation. I am, uh, as some of you may know, also a translator, and my feeling really is that when you translate, you ought to efface yourself as much as possible, enter the text, and remain as much as possible literal to the text, because you don't know why a word was chosen, and finalization is certainly not goal orientation. Now let's see if I can do anything with this thing here. Um, it's coming slowly. Um, so then he goes on to say, um, the, the, the opposition to finalization on the ruses of finalization in all its domains. Okay, here I am, here I am. Just my, let me find the, ah, there we go. There we go. Okay, so the ruses of finalization and the juridical consequences of these ruses. And then he goes on to say, these new responsibilities cannot be purely academic. And so I do speak also in terms not only of what can be controlled inside even a great university such as this one, go moving toward, as we heard, greater greatness, which has the courage to propose such a conference. But I would like us also to look outside and not just remain satisfied with the, 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 the support and the encouragement that the institution provides. Um, Derrida goes on, if these responsibilities remain extremely difficult to assume, extremely precarious and threatened, it is because they must at once keep alive the memory of a tradition. And the make an opening beyond any program that is, and this is important, toward what is called the future. The title of my uh, text on Du Bois, by the way, it's not Du Bois, it's not French, Hessian, and so therefore the pronunciation of the name is Du Bois, not a French pronunciation. So therefore, uh, anyway, the, um, the, um, the uh, title was mentioned, and I do say future for the philosophers of the future. So we look outside of the walls of the university, but we also look outside without making conclusions. In the humanities, it's a different ballgame. If 
the other disciplines produce knowledge. The humanities, especially the literary humanities, teach the practice of learning. We don't, we teach how to learn from the singular and the unverifiable. This is a very, very difficult thing to learn and without it, there is absolutely no justice in the world because you cannot, in fact, verification is extremely important. I'm not downplaying verification, but if one remains in the subject position of the verifier, I don't need to tell an audience such as this one as to what happens to institutional knowledge. So we have to take the responsibility, especially of the literary humanities, which have the extraordinarily difficult task of teaching the practice of learning, the practice indeed of freedom, which is very different from just the production of knowledge. And today, our universities, including my own, Columbia University in the city of New York, they are forgetting the, this, particular, uh, this particular fact that speed and efficiency is not everything. Remember, the fascists made the trains run on time. Speed and efficiency is not everything. You also have to slow cook the soul for epistemological change at universities such as this one. And that is the task of especially the literary humanities. At any rate, at this rate, if I ad lib like this, I'll never finish anything. So if this, this was where Berida was when the, when the institute was being founded. Your hope for this second conference is to plot the changes within the humanities and discuss the consequences. Very important. But the real change, not exactly new, may be outside, as I said, I'm always looking at the outside. I, I wrote a book called Outside in the Teaching Machine. When you say that you are, you claim radicality or you claim something new, some of us oldies remind our students and our colleagues that every self-declared rupture, I'm doing something new, is also an unacknowledgeable repetition. This is unfortunately the limits of what we claim for ourselves. So to an extent, the, I would say that the change is not exactly new here, and, I, uh, at, it, may, and it may be outside the humanities. I mean, of course, the fierce demand for an emphasis on STEM in curriculum and pedagogy. By STEM, as you must know, it's the English acronym STEM. By STEM, as you must know, is meant science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. A demand for finalizing. And you just heard what, uh, where we go back to, in, for coming to conclusions. Reject the open-endedness of the humanities. We must remind ourselves that every self-declared rupture, as I just said, is also a repetition to make over practice more, to make our practice more canny. We must remind ourselves of this. Mike's picking me up, right? Because I move my head a little. It's okay, right? You can hear me. All right, so in uh, the fall of 2020, I had the great good fortune of teaching a course on mathematics and the humanities. No, I'm a university professor, right? This is, we are a small group who are, uh, we are 16 of us in all of the fields, and our task is to teach the whole university. I don't belong to a department. The others are much smarter than I think. I'm a token, I was the first woman of color to be appointed university professor in Columbia's 254 years, they needed someone whose skin wasn't white and who, <laughs> who didn't, uh, who sat on another kind of gentle, so they put me in there. I'm, my self-concept was not enhanced 
by this, it's a wonderful thing. But we are supposed to teach, you know, we don't belong to a department, so therefore, mathematics, right? Mathematics and the humanities. My co-teacher, a renowned mathematician, Michael Harris, invited a guy called Kevin Buzzard, who is an equally renowned mathematician, to visit one of our class sessions. In response to my question as to why he focused on numbers theory, he said that what really appealed to him was that it can simply be correct. How can the human mind produce mathematics is the implicit question. And as I say, this ain't new. This is a question that has been asked by what is called the first philosophers of almost every civilization. How is it possible that we, who are so fallible, so full of sin, guilt, stupidity, and so on, how is it that we can also produce something so pure, clean, and divine even? Uh, remember, uh, the, uh, the followers of Nicomachus, they, one of them was put to death because of the claim toward the square root of two. So therefore, the idea of how can the human mind be able to produce mathematics is not a new idea. And this Kevin Buzzard was implicitly telling me that, nice young man. But um, I said, that the contingent, however, escapes even the correctness of mathematics, a questioning of finalization, totalization. The contingent escapes all programming. The contingent escapes all, all even the most advanced artificial intelligence projects. The contingent, we may not be able even to think contingency on that level. But one thing is for sure, the contingent escapes. Contingency in this sense is the opposite of the necessary. It is, by the way, I know uh, Natalia was telling me that you teach Sanskrit, so I presume you don't teach just the language but some of the philosophical stuff. If there's anybody here who actually is interested in that, this, the difference between what Kevin Buzzard liked, mathematics, because it's able to deliver correctness. And what we were talking about, the contingent, this in Indic thinking is the difference between Sankhya, which is the mathematical Sankhya, right? I see that someone knows because they're smiling, good. This is the difference between Sankhya and practical Vedanta. Practical Vedanta is the contingent. I wish I could go on on that. But um, I'm just going to throw this out so that I don't speak too long. Already 20 minutes. Um, I'm on the first page. Contingency in this sense is the opposite of the necessary. When the rules that you have learned won't fit the imperative to action, how do you act? Anybody who has done any kind of real activism of that sort, knows in, uh, even in teaching, knows very well that the real moment is when none of the rules you've learned is going to work. And so right there, quickly, like an athlete, you have to, your muscle memory of your head, as it were, produces something. That's the contingent. The, uh, those are the moments when past and future happen it is this grasping of the contingent that Charles Bernstein calls poetry and writes, I quote, poetry is not the end of politics. It is the beginning of politics because it is in that moment. By politics, Bernstein means thoughtful problem solving when the rules that you have learned will not serve as the learned grammar will not serve poetry so that we must go from the word to meaning straight line to what Jacques Lacan would call the boomerang of the parabola, the parable, poetry. So the rules learnt will not work. So you go 
somewhere else right off, and that's what Bernstein is describing as also politics, because that's the political moment when you have to do something. The good strategist, you know, even the good tactician is different from the one who blindly follows rules, not much use. So therefore, the, this is, this is the, uh, the, this is the um, uh, um, uh, way in which one thinks of the contingent. The um, con contingency is where the humanities hang out because if other disciplines, as I said, are engaged in producing knowledge, the humanities teach the practice of learning. But we don't teach that way anymore. A hundred years ago, the great Albanian-Italian activist political philosopher, Antonio Gramsci, wrote to himself that the, quote, new intellectual ought to be a, quote, permanent persuader. He could not assume internet or artificial intelligence or special effects without a slow humanity style preparation, persuasion has become hysterical marketing on every level. So that particular one, he could not really think to this kind of a future. And anyway, he died in jail, so he couldn't even try out the things that he said. So therefore, I should describe, disclose, before I go back to your main question that, because of the peculiarity of these changes, you're thinking about change, I have been speculating about and hesitantly practicing and the humanity, uh, uh, humanities beyond the disciplines. That would be my main recourse for teaching in a broken world. But let us for the moment turn your question loose. Are these extradisciplinary changes evolutionary or revolutionary? Have they developed through gradual internal changes or do they come like a shock that changes everything? The answers are diversified. You don't really have regular, I, I was happy to notice on the program that most, some people haven't really paid any attention to this at all, but those who have in general and hesitantly but definitely undone the difference, revolution, evolution. I think that's smart because the answers are diversified by the politics of race, class, gender, and historical location, accessibility. What is revolution for one is something that evolved slowly. You see this very much, I wish I could go on on this. You, you see this very much in the way in which European thinking developed and was imposed after the, uh, the, the industrial capitalist um, uh, capitalism began, um, uh, the um, colonialism, I mean, began. So that what became for us a sudden shock was, in fact, Europe had a long time, Western, not Western Europe, had a long time to develop from absolutism to democracy and took that time to develop theories that for us became imposition. So was it evolution or revolution? Depends upon the historical situation, and this is still true. They're diversified. Better go to the Bolivian political philosopher, whose name I'm sure many in this room know, and whose work, René Zavaleta, to learn how to express the diversified worldviews of motley societies. And most of our societies are motley with many different kinds of discourses. And Zavaleta's credit was that he said that each one of these is modern. It's not that some of them are backward and some of them are modern. And that's how we figure out how to behave toward the others. He said, we must learn how to express the diversified worldviews of each of these discourses, each one, quote, modern in its own way, on different spots on the evolution, revolution grid. And we should lend him a hand with gender, because most of these thinkers really don't think gender is an important 
thing to be sensitive to, we should lend Zavaleta a hand with gender via thinkers like Silvia Rivera Pusikanki, whose name I hope you also know. So that's my, that's my, uh, that's my feeling toward evolution, revolution as a question. It's, we have to acknowledge that these are incredibly diver diversified by historical location, race, class, gender. You can't actually diagnose the, uh, the actual uh, nature, status of questions of one, changes of one sort or another. The, um, in 1998, we founded the Center for Comparative Literature and Society at Columbia. That undertaking to bring literature and the social sciences together by energetic team teaching with the entire faculty rather than just those joint appointed, uh, those were the days, the extraordinary, extraordinary, uh, uh, wonderful time. By the way, revolution, I should perhaps say something else. Let's see. The, uh, the um, revolutionary time is a concept that is to be found. Again, I'm not mentioning very esoteric people. I'm mentioning people whose work you know. David Rudiger. David Rudiger has this really good idea about revolutionary time, by which he means the time during which we make these changes, like the excitement that you now have, because you really have launched something very interesting in this, I hope this series goes on. But Rediger says that when, in fact, some of the achievements are in, uh, things cool down, and we see, we see that, for example, in post-feminism. Things cool down, and people don't have that excitement anymore, and so you don't have the kind of energetic production of uh, thinking and living and acting and teaching and all of that stuff as you did during the time. And most of us have, most of us who try to do this kind of energetic change, most of us have the experience of people saying, oh, wonderful, really, uh, you have helped me a great deal, etc." All of this belongs to the, to the um, temporary energy of revolutionary times. So to an extent, we have, to, we have to think about the fact that the novelty of these kinds of undertakings, like the, uh, like the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, or the, uh, on a greater level, the Collège Athénée National de Philosophie, novelty of these kinds of undertakings become institutionalized. This is no reason to give up on their initial novelty as some of our friends and associates have done on the college, saying, well, you know, it's not what it used to be, but just, just another college. But no, I think that is not correct. But to realize that, because it's going to happen to this too, but to realize that institutionality must be persistently and constructively resisted from within, even as we senior folks acknowledge our complicity, our folded togetherness with the institution that also fosters us. You said that we are in the 60s. And indeed, in 1968, I mean, you know, I was already an assistant professor in 1968. I'm old. But during that time, we really thought, mind you, a young assistant professor, the, um, <laughs> during that time, uh, we thought that if we really more or less got rid of the university, there would be liberation. How wrong we were. The, I was given an honorary doctorate some time ago by Vincent Saint-Denis, which was very much sort of our home, as it were. So that to an extent, the, um, the idea that institutions are to be destroyed is a wrong idea. The people accuse me of being an institutionalist. If you were within the institutions that I have inhabited, you wouldn't say so. 
But on the other hand, this is just a one-shot lecture, right? So I have to be calm and modest, uh, not my usual way. So therefore, I, I, hope, I hope you will accept what I'm saying, that we senior folks acknowledge our complicity, our folded togetherness with the institution that also fosters us. Hortense Spillers, one of the most intense supporters of the humanities, has a, Hortense is just three months younger than I, so we are the same era, right? Hortense has one of the most intense supporters of the humanities, and she has an interesting expression. When protest turns to curriculum, we would do well to remember it. We would do well to remember it. It's a moving uh, situation. It's not a situation where you can just simply take something for granted. Now, you have taken on an impossible task, in other words. Now, what kind of impossible? I was going to make a, I was going to make a third slide, but I lost my little um, some uh, my pen drive this morning, so I didn't have the time. But some of you know this. The, uh, the, it, it's impossible with the parentheses around the I am of the impossible, okay? So you have taken on an impossible task, the only kind of task worth taking on in the long run. These are the only kinds of tasks that teach us that practice, quote, norms theory, that practice norms theory, rather than applying theory or following theory. That's that whole contingency thing that I was talking about. Practice norms theory, and therefore, it is crucial that we theorize as we practice, as Comte Raufan developed to verändern. The, it's, that's, the, that's the way it goes, very careful interpretation, very careful theorizing, knowing that it's going to be normed. Over the years, ever since I commented on the parentheses around the im of impossible as a sign of enablement, as a, that im is, a, you use the typography as meaningful. It's a sign of enablement that impossible as a sign of enablement. It was about 36 years ago. I have had regular requests for discussions of this move, regular requests from all over the world. How is it a sign of enablement when you enter into something that is impossible? And one can actually invite people to come work with one to see how that happens, because the text of the work is a text. You can't just tell someone, but it is a sign of enablement. And that's the kind of task that you folks have chosen in choosing this series. The, the off and you are offering an alternative, therefore, to the ideological support for possessive individualism, self-expression at all costs, leading to identity politics very undemocratic, undemocratic. So to an extent, this, this idea of, uh, of this impossible idea is an important thing. Now this is what I call an imperative, something that comes from outside and tells you, you know, this ideological support that you're withdrawing from what's happening all around us in the way people think. So today's imperative is to keep undoing the colonial conference structure. The you know, conferences are fantastic, and we must use them. That is also an institutional validation. But you are not going to achieve the impossible task that you've set yourself of really thinking about the discipline broadly if you keep within the conference structure, which is basically, let's say, like the United Nations, colonial because the world is broken, a broken world, by colonially noticeable war. War was going on all over the place, all over the place. The Cold War became hot very quickly. 
but the notice that we get because it is the United States against something. This is a colonially recognizable war, Ukraine and Israel. These, and therefore, the world is broken more seriously, including the universities and institutions that we inhabit. One is afraid of one. This is my 58th year of full-time teaching at a university all over the place. But now, I'm a little afraid of the university. This is a very shocking new development. So therefore, the, I would say that the world is broken because it's a colonially noticeable war. And development gone awry with digitalization. This is something, this is the broken world. So the real problem, therefore, is the world's wealth of languages. They must not be rejected because they don't make money. And how, how do I know this? Because after all, I am a senior person and I am on all kinds of committees because you need a colored woman. And so therefore, I'm, like, I'm not very good on committees, but I'm on many committees. But the thing is, and you see that again and again, perfectly wonderful people, and I could name names, but it's not uh, interesting, would say, you know, languages, and this is not the case here at this university. Natalia has been telling me about some of the uh, language things that you do, and it's fantastic, fantastic. Keep it that way, because we uh, hear again and again, it's not, there's not much of a demand. Hey, have they forgotten the lessons about marketing that they learned? You create demand, especially a grand university, brand name university like mine. So to an extent, this is, they, they, cannot be, they cannot be rejected because they don't make money. The argument that I have made many, many times is that the cost of spiritual health care must be accepted over the price of violence. It's not, it is the health care of society, not physical. But uh, this, is, this argument I've made many times on many levels, that you actually bear that cost to take care of the price of violence. But so therefore, what happens is that the, um, in the development lobby, the, uh, the wealth of languages is, a, is, a, is, a, is an inconvenience. Again, th there's work that I do that relates to this, but I'm just going to throw this out because I have done half an hour already. Okay, so um, the, re the real problem. I have offered two structures to two, uh, two kinds of groups as to how we can deal with this. And because this is our imperative. And let me say, uh, let me pause a moment on the idea of imperatives. This is uh, the, the, the title, Imperatives to Reimagine the Planet. So I believe you folks are responding to an imperative, and imperatives come from the outside. And here I will go into the problem as I have just kind of introduced them. But a word on imperative. It's, it, my title was Imperatives to Reimagine the Planet that I proposed to the Stiftung Dialogik in Zurich, Switzerland, in 1997, as they were restructuring to move from rescuing Jews who had managed to escape from Hitler's concentration camps during the Second World War to providing asylum for refugees from Rwanda, Somalia, Turkey, and the like. And I was, again, I was deeply honored that I was asked to give a talk that would actually uh, see this move from one kind of rescue work to another kind of support walk, work. And my title was Imperatives to Reimagine the Planet. It's available, this text, and maybe some of you have read it. An imperative is an urgent command, generally brought about by external circumstances. And in that particular case in Switzerland, ex external circumstances that had changed from a European to a global situation. I used it again in China in 2018 in my title, Imperative 
to reimagine the Silk Road so that as an Indian a citizen and, and as someone who lives in the United States now for 62 years, I'm in a position of opposition to China, friendly opposition sometimes, but politically, uh, in India it's a kind of competition and in the United States you know what it is, it's much publicized. At any rate, so my, uh, my, uh, my task as a humanities person who was actually requested to do this by uh, a, a vice president for arts and sciences at Yunnan Normal University was to be able to think from within how to reimagine the Silk Road as one was constantly asked in the United States to think of the Marshall Plan as a very wonderful thing. So to an extent, I used this idea of an imperative from coming from the outside, again, in China. In my title, Imperative to Reimagine the Silk Road, I cannot elaborate this in the interest of time, but I just simply wanted to say that I had indeed recognized that you folks were also responding to an imperative, a global imperative, to do something different. And that's another reason why I wanted to come and join you. I have suggested to the Comparative and International Education Society, an organization that has been responsible and active since 1956, and then to the World Economic Forum, where I was on the now defunct uh, Committee on Values, the, uh, the, a certain way in which the um, we can accommodate this imperative, which has been, uh, which has been um, ripening for some time. I have said that I would suggest a general structure as the agency of a permanent and persistent revolution, your word again, uh, and, but this is an evolutionary revolution, so it's somewhat undone. A permanent revolution, that's a different kind of idea a permanent and persistent revolution, a worldwide educational initiative on a thoroughly decentralized cellular model and an ongoing effort to keep it that way. This is a big, long speech that is readily available. But we have a model already, the so-called international civil society model, the so-called global NGOs that renamed themselves the International Civil Society. And what we should perhaps think about doing is, you know, not discard the university or its structure or the way in which pedagogy operates. That's too valuable. But as we look outside, we should perhaps also think of inhabiting that structure that is already provided and go toward this kind of thoroughly decentralized cellular model and an ongoing effort to keep it that way. And to the World Economic Forum, I said, specifically as a member of that group, you have to learn the habit of thinking about other people as equal, though not same. Not just top-down philanthropy. This is, this is a very hard one. This is a very hard one. Maybe I should show the first picture. You see, these are my two classes, right? On the left-hand side, you have, I was speaking to people who were doing adult education, therefore I did adults children, that's Columbia. And on the right-hand side, this is just last week, the schools that I've been running for uh, 40 years now, and, the, uh, so, and there they are, like many of you, sitting on the floor. So it's very, very hard to think of the right-hand side group as a uh, equal. All over the world, we talk equality, but it's top-down philanthropy, and people not interested in involving themselves in the quality of the education. My standards are the same, both at Columbia, which pays me a salary, which I can use in the other area to repay ancestral debts, because 
although I'm an atheist, I was born a caste Hindu, and we are the ones who really destroyed these people cognitively caste system for thousands of years. So th therefore, for me, as, as I'm working for them, Ramshi would call it producing the subaltern intellectual, it's the first thing that one has to learn is to really think equality rather than just simply a nice sentimental idea of, you know, they're human beings, I'm helping them, type nonsense. So to an extent, the, um, uh, I told uh, these uh, World Economic Forum people, you have to learn the habit of thinking about other people as equal, though not same. Exactly the situation between, I said to them, the reading pupil and the one who produced the literary work. Let me explain, I said to them, this last s statement. I'm a teacher of literature, as well as a member of the Council on Values of the World Economic Forum. So perhaps I emphasize literary reading too much. But I've also given time and skill, not just money and site visits. For 40 years, training teachers and children at small elementary schools established by me among the landless illiterate Dalits in Western West Bengal. So I said to them, however impractical I may seem to you folks, committed to speed and efficiency, hear me out. Normally our desire, you see, this is the humanities uh, teaching for a broken world in other contexts. The people who really want to do what the, what the, third, the 11th thesis wanted to do, develop for Endan, you know, we, another world is possible, World Economic Forum, but fast. Normally our desire is to do things ourselves or for ourselves. In good literary teaching, the student is taught carefully to hang out in the space of the other, understand what they confront in terms of the unknown person who wrote what they confront. This is the secret of the ethical and the democratic. One has to stay with it, not follow easy steps so that one can say, I have helped you. Meaningless statement, and you will also see that people in that situation will smile and say, yes, you have. The photograph, proof. This is ridiculous. Uh, I call it, uh, because I've seen so much of it over the last 40 years, uh, activism as target practice. The uh, one has to stay with it. Today, the emphasis in education is acquiring digital speed. In order to be able to use the digital for social justice, the soul has to be trained slowly. And that is where literary training, as I describe it, comes into play. Recently at the celebration, I wrote to them, of the Nigerian writer Chinua Achebe's life, the positive effect of his literary writings was repeatedly emphasized. With my experience of work in Africa, about which I will not speak here, I was obliged to say that below a certain class line, Nigerians had no idea who he was and what he wrote. That's what I was saying about evolution, revolution. Below a certain class line, who he was and what he wrote. The task, therefore, was to expand the circle of Nigerians who could not only read, I mean, literacy is a useless uh, task. Literacy is good, but nothing by itself. We don't send our children to school to be literate, the only. To expand the circle of Nigerians who could not only read, but also learn from the literary, just as we would say that we must ex attempt to expand the circle of people for whom our kind of work is meaningful. Why is there such an upsurge of interest in knowledge? Asks Lawrence Prusak, editor of Knowledge in Organizations, and cites the pre-Socratics. Such a question ignores the plain fact that the word knowledge, and anyway, it's an English word, knowledge has changed since the pre-Socratics. 
There was, of course, no English at that time. And if we are thinking the world, we must absolutely remember the many languages that make meanings for its people. You, you're reminded of something. Excuse me. The watch is, <laughs> is giving an alarm. I don't know what it is that you have to be reminded of. It, perhaps it's 50 minutes, okay. It's 10 minutes short of an hour, so I will just, just tell you what I was going to do, okay? So the, uh, the, the, at least in the ethical, we should know that this is, you see, there's a, there's a top-down health worker in, uh, who told me, who works in Kenya, who told me, a, a doctor working in Kenya, who refuses to be simply that top-down health worker from, my, from Colombia, public health. The people will understand Swahili, but you can't speak to their heart unless you spare, speak their unsystematized language. I'm getting what you're saying, but I'm not taking it in. This is what uh, one of the, the so-called uh, uh, developees said to this person. So th that is a basic human value, talking to the heart. If you think it is inconvenient, don't dream of improving the world. Real knowledge depends, as I said, on cooking the soul with slow learning, not the instant soup of a one-size-fits-all toolkit. The world is not populated by humanoid drones. You cannot produce a toolkit for a moral metric. Or if you do, <clears throat> you will be disappointed. So within a university such as yours, <coughs> The problem with language learning is that there is no demand for the kind of proficiency you would need for accessing society and culture and identity globally. See, that's another thing that you must remember. You cannot do, that's why it's an impossible task. It has to be collective and global. So therefore, the collective approach, truly collective, attempting globality, should be at least considered, however low profile. We are attempting to launch a collective subtitling approach in the world's subaltern, subaltern languages of available <coughs> videos that will approach native speakers with a growing suite of, of, uh, of uh, cartographic responsibility rather than an equally simple sense of victimage. In a more disciplinary approach, I mean, this is a very complicated project that we are doing, and I would again be happy to talk about it, but I should bring my prepared um, uh, words to a close. We are also trying to develop global, more disciplinarily, global criticality to a complex and important texts that do not fall within our specialty at a plenary round table of the mo annual convention of the Modern Language Asso Association. Here's a list of the things that we have. See, look it. If you look at it, I'm not going to talk about them. And the Modern Language Association has allowed us to actually, actually uh, repeat this for six years. And now we're looking forward to the seventh. And this is not something that usually happens at the MLA because they feel that this is an important effort at confronting change, this sudden, sudden uh, imperative to globalize, so a, a, a uh, um, um, a th uh, making thin, diluting of our skills. We know this very well. And a kind of academic tourism where people say, oh, yes, in my culture also, and you can tell that they know nothing. I mean, and generally it's like, English department, or French department, Russian department, not people who actually work because that's not as global. And so therefore, what do we do? Do we behave like this and lose our sensitivity to things that happen? Or do we learn how to be globally critical without changing our specialties? So we do these things every year. And this year we are doing this huge, huge book, Origin and Development of the Bengali language. Now, the, uh, uh, we are looking forward to our seventh meeting on January 6th in Philadelphia. We hope the Modern Language Asso Association will continue to support this effort 
at confronting change. This is not the moment to list individual efforts. I have looked carefully at items on your program that anticipate and match these kinds of suggestions. I'm indeed sorry, as I said, I will not be able to attend these, but I've realized, as I've been wandering, uh, wandering about in Asia and Europe this last month, that my dwindling energies should be focused on not just simply speaking at conferences, and so I go home tomorrow. Let me now end with the biggest change, requiring the imaginative activism, hoping for producing epistemological performance that is the signature of humanity's teaching. Humanity's teaching beyond the disciplines seeks with infinite patience the basic human affects of greed, fear, and violence through uncoercive rearrangement of desires. It is long-term work, work to be repeated generation after generation if the Anthropocene the definitive predication of being human, material superadequation, making more than needed, will allow this. Teaching in the literary humanities is, in fact, practicing, practice in effacing ourselves to, to go inside the, the um, to go inside the, um, to go inside the uh, text and try to wish what the text wishes, try to desire as the text desires. So therefore, the, uh, that's really the most important change. But the short-term negotiations are mired in the politics of greed, as we see from the so-called negotiations at COP28 in Dubai. So this thing is a very important task, the most important change planetarity where an ever greater impossibility beckons. But you know what happened with this now, which I'm just going to make, and this is absolutely the last move. I'm going to uh, quote from, the, from Daedalus, which is certainly a journal that many of you know in this room. It is the journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences to which I was, once again, I think somewhat as a token, I'm perceived as dangerous because I'm too left-leaning. But at any rate, Anthony Appiah actually invited me in. He's a friend, Anthony, so he risked it. But this is one of the, uh, the oldest in America, right? Well, this is the Academy, and on the other side, there's the American Philosophical Society, uh, established by Benjamin Franklin, the first uh, member, apparently, and there's a letter proving so, of the American Academy was George Washington, Dollarville. So uh, the thing is, in the, the, this, uh, this, uh, this academy uh, has a journal called Daedalus. And, in the, and you know, I'm not being, uh, I'm not being uh, disloyal because I've already expressed my sentiments, and it's a published journal at the top. What do they say about the humanities? They check, they, this is an edition on the humanities. They check how many times blue collar workers visit museums to tell us that the humanities have improved. This statistical approach, I mean, it's a very good approach. First of all, blue collar workers going to museums. Good thing, eh? Working class thinking about museums. Imagine the assumption. And then the statistical average does not exist. It's the result of adding and dividing. So therefore, they do, the humanities are not against statistics, but they must realize that the subject of statistics does not exist. And this in the face of what we are facing today, the whole world is being run by uh, a system that doesn't care about the Sphinx or Copernicus or anything. The, the actual planetary that we are unleashing through greed. But anyway, then, no, the tremendous, this is me, the tremendous eruption of mass killings in the United States, greed and violence, and extremist hate crimes as collective practice in the sustained absence of humanity's edu education, which is effacing oneself to attempt to enter another place, 
in the general culture is the problem, not, not going to museums. Just talking about this to students produces no results. This journal article that I'm taking as my sample, sample relies on statements about the humanities as a statistical criterion for measuring perception of the humanities. It is as if you should teach someone piano by talking about piano playing. When we want to do something in the world with our knowledge, with such inadequate preparation, we engage, as I said, in top-down philanthropy and infinite self-congratulation. This is a phenomenon of top-down philanthropy. Classroom teaching of the practices of learning allows us to understand that the line from knowing to doing is not guaranteed. And then it goes on to say, there is no crisis in the humanities, and the humanities don't really need to be taught because they exist in, quote, ordinary language, I quote. The humanities crisis, a frame that academic humanists often feel is all-consuming, is not a crisis in the awareness of larger society, though it does receive some attention in college journalism. Look at the contempt. The humanities are threaded throughout people's experiences as part of the ordinary happenings of life. In other words, you don't have to teach it. It's like those of us who were establishing women's studies in the 70s, and we were co constantly told, if it succeeds, then you should stop, kind of a suicide mission. Their technique, listening to the humanities from this is, this is knowledge management at its worst, from three universities in California, the University of Miami, and Illinois Institute of Technology, and concluding from this a general perception of the humanities, in fact tracks how the common noun humanities fares in language in a section of US English in its incessant movement. The toolkit, the box of rules that they have chosen will not allow them to acknowledge that there is also a proper noun called the humanities. They're just looking at the common noun because that's what they know. A proper noun called the humanities, an arena for acknowledging the contingent for problem solving action, that it has a 2000 year old history, the Euro US, and an older history claimed by East and South Asia. It is generally concerned with educating into citizenship and today through the practice of self-effacing entry into another space is our basic tool for teaching not to want unrestricted greed and violence and extremist hate as normal. Therefore, and this is where I'm going to end not describing what I'm talking about, we follow the new international and heed Raymond Williams when he shows us that the dominant constantly changes opposition to alternatives and thus produce a kind of repressive tolerance within institutional structures. In my own case, the new international worked out this way, and this is the end, I quote, a single teacher students flung out into the world and time is a better real world example of the precarious continuity of a Marxism to come, much more aligned to the lines of global activism, activism today in the aftermath of 1989 in the hot peace after the Cold War. And today, as the Cold War and the turbulence of the post-1989 legacy has given way to an incipient world war on a new model, the formula seems even more apposite since I'm old enough and I suppose there are some people in this room old enough to know that the internationale did not save the human race. So therefore, we need a new international which depends upon the formation of collectivities in classroom teaching, as it were. And so that, that's where I will end because that's, that brings me to an hour. And that's why I'm here, because I believe that's the kind of model toward which you also will be tending as you have these conferences year after year, choosing newer and newer topics. And I hope the institution will foster you. Thank you.
Professor Spivak, we could not have hoped for greater and better opening to our Congress than your very deep and very impactful <laughs> keynote. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Professor Spivak is open to answer two or three questions. So if you would like to, please. First, you tell me who you are and what you do, okay? And I hope you will ask me questions. I'll tell you why. This is the best moment for me. I don't like listening to my own voice. But, you know, I try to pretend I'm really liking it. But um, when you ask me questions, I learn something. So please. Morning. Good morning. This is the best moment for me, Professor, to ask the question. My name is Camila. I'm from Kazakhstan. Uh, I'm a researcher, uh, and I was. It's an honor for me to just have a chance to ask this question because I've been reading you since 2017, when I firstly got introduced to postcolonial theory. So, uh, having this chance, it's like a big deal. But my question to you is: How do you see the future of postcolonial theory in this broken world that you mentioned? and especially in the world when people do not want to acknowledge the ongoing recognizable colonial war. Yeah. Um, uh, what is it that you research in? Uh, I'm researching national identity, decoloniality uh, in Kazakhstan, Central Asia, and South Caucasus. Thank you very much. Uh, can I take a couple more since there's, I took so much time talking? And then I'll answer uh, the three together. OK. <coughs> Do I see a hand? If, you, if I don't see a hand, then OK. The all right, all right. Tell me who you are. Uh, I can't hear you yet. Uh, I'm Kagolina Krasuska, American Studies Center. Thank you very much for your talk. I saw you in Berlin 20 years ago, and it's as energizing as uh, before. Uh, I have a question about uh, your interest in Du Bois. And, uh, uh, du, Bo uh, du, Bois. du Bois, Du Bois, Du Bois, and uh, uh, I thought you said interest in boys. I thought. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> can't that, answer this. That's one. my that, that's my subaltern accent. Uh, so, um, so uh, there is a text about Du Bois in Warsaw uh, from the fifties. Uh, du Bois looking at the Warsaw ghetto and uh, looking at the ghetto and recognizing uh, the problem of African-Americans. I was just uh, thinking, you know, whether this is something that you uh, kind of take into account, this kind of uh, multi-directional memory uh, that, you know, I think being here, this is an interesting, um, uh, interesting issue. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent question. Do I have a third? No, okay. So, uh, future of post-colonial theory. You know, I, um, uh, I can't really tell because uh, educational institutions are so diversified, you know, <coughs> number one. Number two, I think the future of post-colonial theory, and I, I know you will agree, is not just confined to uh, academic uh, turf battles, you know, like Mignolo fighting with Spivak. It's not, it's not really like that. So uh, given that uh, difficulty, I think the future is not very good. I think it will be some people who will be obsessively interested in it. And that's not that good either, because then you can find in colonialism a, 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 a culprit for everything. And that's, that, uh, quite often ignores, I'm sure you don't, I, but uh, in general, quite often ignores the collaboration with which most colonizing and the violence of colonizing began. Certainly, is there anybody here, in fact, who's, uh, who understands Bengali and so on? No, that's fine, not a problem, <laughs> not a problem. But uh, you see, because in our own case, See, the British entered through Bengal, right? 1793 was permanent settlement, but before that, 1757 was the Battle of Plassey. Now, the Battle of Plassey happened as it happened 
because someone from the Bengali side betrayed the, uh, the Nawab Siraj Dola to Robert Clive. It's collaboration and betrayal. And these kinds of, and sometimes there is positive collaboration because uh, the, uh, the civilizing side of colonialism is admired. Unless we actually take into account this historical situation. I mean, I'm thinking about, again, if there had been a person who were, was into Bengal, they would have known immediately of thinking of the extraordinary work of someone like Michael Madhusudan Dattu. Now, certainly he came back to, uh, to the Bengali tradition, enhanced it, but via collaboration. And in fact, the book that we are reading at the MLA, uh, The Origin and Development of the Bengali Language, 1926, began as a, as a um, dissertation for Cambridge. So to an extent, and he was saying that he was, uh, this Shuniti Chatterjee, that he was applying uh, the, all that was applied to the English language to Bengali to actually create, it's, it's that fat, the book, to actually create a kind of globality for Bengali, his mother tongue, which is older than English as a language, a thousand years of texts. So therefore, from this point of view, I think uh, to make of it an obsessive academic uh, pursuit, it kind of takes away from us the fact that in globality, the old, the old um, uh, long durée type characteristics are coming back, which the violence of colonialism kept under control in a certain way. In uh, India, for example, a return of theocracy. In China, the Silk Road. Uh, all kinds of uh, ways, and we have a think tank called Rethinking Globality. We go from place to place to find, uh, to learn how to descri describe globality rather than the usual story. So I would say that the future is not very good, but a correct way of dealing with how post-coloniality, and listen, I said that the world is broken because colonially recognizable war, since it's between imperialisms that have, have approached, uh, approached us. So it is very important to remain astute in the work on post-coloniality and not just in the classroom. But it is also very important not to make it a kind of obsessive and singular uh, um, approach, because then one does not see the complicity that I was talking about, how much collaboration there was in allowing uh, a certain side. And my work with the unsystematized vernaculars of, of uh, Africa, especially uh, f uh, focusing on Nigeria, has been teaching me a great deal, as well as the work in the, in the villages uh, over the last 40 years. Because quite often, very wonderful, um, extremely smart women, not all smart, who actually do the planting of the rice in the savannas or you know, the agricultural work, they do not even know the name of the state, all right? Smart, illiterate, they don't know the name Nigeria. They don't know the name Pushchim Mongo, West Bengal, and so on. It's a, see, that's a very complicated uh, thing to think about, how they were left out, the subaltern, left outside of nation thinking. So how are we going to do the post-colonial in that context? It's very important, but also very easy to do badly. And as for that fantastic question about Du Bois, my real short answer is yes. And I think this is what, is what is unusual about Du Bois. See, Du Bois's name is coupled generally with Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass, <coughs> both of whom were born enslaved, right? They were, in fact, uh, Booker T. Washington's book is up from slavery, right? And we all know that Frederick Douglass, is his narrative, his autobiography, that he was also uh, enslaved and escaped. The, um, 
but Du Bois was not, Du Bois grew up in a fairly, well, not obvi obviously not fully, but fairly anti-racist Massachusetts society where he was the only black boy in his high school uh, class, but he was also the best student and uh, uh, he was helped to study Latin and Greek so he could go to uh, university rather than vocational stuff that only open to uh, black boys. So he had no model. He had no model. So his model became a kind of double bind. On the one hand, a sort of consensual segregation on the part of the black community because, and this is why the NAACP, which he helped found, was really against him. So uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, right from the start when he published his dissertation, the first black dissertation at Harvard, the right from the start, uh, a desire not to be told that he could only work on black people, but globalize. I can't go further right now because, but as you can see, it's my enthusiasm. I'll just give you my uh, subtitle so that you will know that I'm with you. My sub, my, uh, the title of my book is my, uh, my Brother Borghardt, Globalizing Enslavement. So this, this is the, this is the, the, the text. And so I, I very much appreciate your question and yours. Thank you, Th those were good questions. So I presume you don't have any more questions, right? <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, just a few words uh, of the announcement uh, to our Congress guests. Uh, uh, I would like uh, to inform you that uh, all the sessions take place upstairs, so this you just need to follow the yellow stairs or take a lift. And when you see this kind of a boomerang, this is the Australian patio where you can find coffee and uh, and also lunch break. And uh, all uh, main panel main sessions are held in English, whereas uh, panel sessions uh, may be held in other languages uh, of our faculty. So please uh, read the program carefully because we have sessions in Italian, in Hungarian, in Polish, uh, in French uh, and so on. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the Congress. <laughs>